Hi. Back with Sister Pat. Wow. We have almost completed a whole year. And by the time this is aired, it'll be the eve of 2000, 20,000 and 24. 2024. And I just thank God that he has allowed us to come this far without any hurt, harm, or danger. And I just pray that whatever he wants us to do in 24, that we'll do it better than what we did in 23. I just thank God for all of his benefits, all of his mercies, new mercies, every morning. And with that being said, let us go to God in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. <coughs> thank you, Lord, for being able to see the eve of the beginning of a new year. Help us, Lord, to decrease and you increase in our lives every day. Lord, we want you to be satisfied with our service, with our praise, with our worship, and our love for you. Forgive us, Lord, of anything, anything that we said, thought, or done that was not pleasing in your sight. Lord, we want to be right for you. Lord, we ask for you to remember all the sick and the shut-in, the bereaved. But most of all, Lord, don't let those who have not accepted you for the free pardon of their sins rest content and those who are in a backslidden way. Lord, we pray for the peace of Israel and of Jerusalem and the nation of Israel. And Lord, we pray for all countries all over this world that you created, Lord. All the world leaders and the leaders of this country. Lord, we're in a turmoil. But Lord, help us to stay focused and to keep our heads lifted to the hills where you are, Lord, because we know that all of our help, all of our help cometh from you. We pray and ask all these blessings and these petitions in your name, Jesus. Amen. I just can say, give a shout out to all of you who are listening. Thank you for listening. Keep us in your prayers. Keep us lifted. Because if we ever needed the Lord, we really do need it now. I want to also give a shout out and a lift them up and praise uh, my church, Rise and Ebenezer, Baptist Church, and all the members and all the churches, you know, first all over this world that's gathered in the name of Jesus Christ. We pray for them. I want to also lift up Deacon and Sister Lynn Bidding, Aunt Shirley, Aunt Ina, Alberta Brown, who we call Swanny, my mother-in-law, and all of our families. Sister Loretta and Iris Hatchett, Deacon and Betty Watson, uh, Deacon and Sister uh, Darnell Nelson, we're praying for your healing. Trustee Annette Watson, we're praying for your healing. Deacon and Sister Thompson, continue the good fight. And Aunt Muzz, Eliza Space of Charlotte, we're lifting you up as well. Sister Mary Huggins, we're lifting you, sister, and we love you. Sister Virginia and Alfred Kimbrough. Sister Janie Ellis, we're praying for you, Sister Ellis. And Sister Patricia Byers, we're praying for you too. And, of course, our little drummer boy went home for Christmas, Brother Corey Rutherford. And he was funeralized, will be funeralized on Saturday. We miss him, but we know God has gained 
a drummer boy in heaven. And to the Rutherford and Benson family, you're in our prayers and our thoughts. And we're here. We're just a phone call away. We love you and God bless you during this time. We are blessed to be in a beautiful Sunday school lesson or lesson, Bible lesson today. And it's taken from the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. prophet. And it's taken from uh, Jeremiah, the 31st chapter, verses 27 to 34. Jeremiah, the 31st chapter, verses 27 to 34. And it's entitled, Promise of a New Covenant. Promise of a New Covenant. And you know, we like to do a little bit of background before we get started. But before we do that, I want to read this also concerning Jeremiah from uh, Dr. Tony Evans' uh, book that I have. And it says, before he was called a prophet of the Lord, Jeremiah was a priest living in Anathar in the territory of Benjamin. He began prophesying in the 13th year of the reign of Judah's King Josiah and continued until Judah's exile in Babylon. Thus Jeremiah's ministry started in about 626 BC and continued for several years after 586 BC. Jeremiah saw the downfall of Judah, the destruction of Jerusalem, and the exile of God's people because of the tremendous sorrow this caused him. He is often referred to as the weeping prophet <coughs> because he tried to warn them and they still stiff neck, hard headed and he continued and it looked like nobody was going to ever ever return to the ways of old he was the weeping prophet but God gives us assurance even when we have loved ones who seem like they just don't want to listen to what you have to say about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ don't give up. Don't give up. Jeremiah was born into a priestly family, as I said, and called to be a prophet at a young age. His words were not accepted by the establishment in Judah. Considered one of the most revealing prophets of the Old Testament, Jeremiah's prophetic career prepared the children of Israel for their imminent exile. His poetic words, graced by God's calling, offer both warning and promise to the Israelites. Jeremiah's words are regarded as an important part of the prophetic calling and tra trajectory of the Israelites and still resonate as important words for us today. Amen. The book of Jeremiah is a pre-exilic prophetic book, meaning that it was written, written prior to Israel's exile from the Promised Land. This is important to know as it helps us better understand Jeremiah's role as a prophet. It also helps us understand his prophecy and impending exile. <coughs> Excuse me and the promise of a new covenant as reflected of the overreaching things of the text. <coughs> Excuse me. Jeremiah's prophecy speaks into the future when God's new covenant would restore them 
to the promised land and empower his people to live for him by writing his law. Not on stone, not on paper, but in our hearts. <coughs> and Jeremiah, excuse me, who was once a priest of God, promoted him to be a prophet. The book of Jeremiah is prophesying the Israelites' Babylonian capture, period of captivity, <clears throat> and return to the promised land. In chapter 31, Jeremiah not only offers them the hope of freedom, also a new covenant that is more than just following rules. It is a covenant, amen that changes the heart. This new covenant, Jeremiah explains, will be with them even when they are absent from one another and serve as a permanent reminder of God's grace and redemptive power. So we just thank God. And what we're going into today is Jeremiah's, God has given him this prophecy of what is to come in a dream. And he lets us know that as he awake, these are the words of what the Lord is saying and what he means for his people to know. Yes, they may be captured, they may have to be in exile or whatever, but there is hope for the people of God. And Jeremiah is spreading this hope for these people and not for them only, but for us as well. Our first segment is, on this beautiful lesson, Payback mm, for Disobedience. Payback for Disobedience, Jeremiah 31, 27 through 30. And it reads like this. Behold, the days come saith the Lord, that I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of man and with the seed of beasts. So it's going to come on not only on man, but on your livestock as well. And it shall come to pass that like as I have watched over them to pluck up and to break down, and to throw down, and to destroy, and to afflict, so will I watch over them to build and to plant, saith the Lord. In those days, they shall say no more, the fathers have eaten a sour grape, and the children's teeth are set on edge. Now, just want to put a little bookmark right there. God is an ever loving God. But he does get tired. And he's letting them know. He said, this day is coming now. And he's giving this vision and this prophetic vision to Jeremiah. He said, this day is coming, said the Lord, when I will greatly increase the human population and the number of animals here in Israel and in Judah. He will replace. He said, in the past, this is God speaking now, I deliberately uprooted and tore down the nation. God did it. He said he deliberately did that. He said, I overthrew it, destroyed it, and brought disaster upon it. But in the future, I will just as deliberately plant it and build it up. I, the Lord, have spoken. He said, just like I tore it down, because you were disobedient, you were stiff-necked, hard-headed, I can build it back up and I will build it back up. But I had to get rid of those things that was keeping it bound. 
But he says, I will. Just as desperately as I tore it down, just as desperately I will build it back again. And he said, I said that. The people will no longer quote this Proverbs. The parents have eaten sour grapes, but their children's mouth pucker at the taste. And I want to say, yes, we have DNA, we have generational curses, and we have all those things. This is saying, the parents will not be responsible for the children's sin nor will the children be responsible for the parents' sin. Each individual, those sour grapes, sin, you will have to stand before God for yourself. You will be judged for yourself. You will be punished for yourself. You will, re will be rewarded for yourself. So he's saying, don't say, oh, well, my mom and daddy used to do this. Oh, this is, this is what our family do. That's why, hallelujah, thank God, I was sharing with a sister the other day, and she was saying some things, and I said, well, no, that's not biblical. And she says, well, that's what mom and daddy, I said, bless their hearts, mom and daddy did not have the understanding that you have now. Some of them couldn't read, didn't know, but you have had the opportunity to learn. And just because mama, daddy, grandmama, them said it, we have to go on the word of God. We must go on the word of God because his word will stand. His word is true and is forever. So that's why even though we may have some ways. We all do. But God said, we must be. We have to be born again. So he can transform us into his way. Because we were born in sin, shaped in iniquity, and we're going to do wrong. There's no one exempt. There was only one perfect person. This walk this earth. And he took on all of our ugly ways to cleanse us. But he is perfect. He was the only one that could do that. But all the rest of us are scarred, deformed. So we must look to Jesus and be born again under him so that we can be more like him. It says in verse 30. But everyone shall die for his own iniquity. Every man that eateth the sour grapes, his teeth shall be set on edge. Means you're responsible. Don't put it on anybody else. Because God gave us all a free will. And we have to stand account for ourselves. All people, everybody, would die for their own sins. Those who eat this sour grape will be the ones whose mouth will pucker. So you know how it is when you eat something sour. You Ooh, it's not a good feeling and it doesn't taste right that's the way sin is it'll look good oh I got to have this oh this got to be right but once you indulge in it you'll see that it wasn't as good as it looked so we have to ask the Lord to help us Holy Spirit show me which way to go because there are consequences when you commit wrong when you sin against God's word we thank God 
God reminds them of a popular proverb, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> about sour grapes. This proverb was used to explain how children suffer the consequences of their parents' disobedience. The Lord said that this dynamic would no longer be in effect. In the days when he brought Israel back, every person would pay for his or her own sinful ways. This means that he would treat each person's sin individually. A person's sin would be their own responsibility and they will reap the consequences if they're good or if they're bad. So we're responsible. Don't put it on anybody else. We are responsible. God gave us a free will mind and it's up to us to decide whose side you're going to be on. Amen. Our second segment, and really our last segment is pretty short. Restoration through a new covenant. Amen. Restoration through a new covenant. And it's taken from verses 31 to 34 in the same chapter of Jeremiah 31. It says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. <coughs> Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt which my covenant they break. Although I was a husband, a master, a provider for them. Unto them, said the Lord. What is God saying? He said the day is coming. That's what the Lord said. When I will make a new covenant. I'm going to start over. With the people of Israel and Judah. <clears throat> and this covenant will not be the one I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand you remember out of the land of Egypt but still they broke that covenant though I loved them as a husband loves his wife says the Lord they broke that covenant. Took them out of slavery. Led them out of Egypt. Through the Red Sea. And even through the wilderness. He provided for them. And they still murmured, complained. Started worshiping idol gods. And doing whatever they want to do. And then... <clears throat> what really gets to me and I have to be reminded when they often say it Moses you should have left us in Egypt we did better in Egypt you see the enemy can get in your mind that's why we have to ask the Lord to remove, renew our mind because those past things that he delivered you from. The devil knows. I love it when uh, Jonathan McReynolds, the singer, he says, you may have forgotten what you were delivered from, but the devil has it. And he'll play on you. He'll play in that mind and make you think, oh well, it's all right. That wasn't that bad. We're human. I can ask the Lord to forgive me. Don't take that chance. Don't take that chance. 
dismiss it immediately. Because God has been mighty good. He carried those children of Israel out of Egypt. He carried you and me out of our Egypt land too. He's the one that led us out and gave us a mind that we need to change. We need a transformation. We need you, Lord, in our lives. Because the way I'm going, I'm going down a dark hole of destruction. So don't play with the devil. Don't let him play with your mind. Oh, it wasn't that bad. I wasn't that bad. Yes, you were. Yes, I was. But thank God for his ever-loving love, his ever-loving kindness, and his ever-loving long-suffering which each and every one of us. Don't let the enemy make you think that you can get away. You may say, well, I can go out here and do such and such and such and such, and I'll, I'll ask the Lord to forgive you. But, <coughs> excuse me, he may require your soul before you have the opportunity to ask for forgiveness. And don't tempt God. Joseph ran, <laughs> fleed from Potiphar's wife when she tried to entice him. He didn't say, no, just don't, don't do that. He ran till he left part of his garment and she used that to lie against him. But God was with Joseph, just like God is with us. But we have to let, we have to let the world know that I'm part of God. And he's part of me. And most of all, Lord, I want to be available for you. I want you to use me. And you can't use me if I'm letting the devil use some of me too. He wants us totally. Totally. He wants us to be totally committed to him. So, he said that he delivered them out of Egypt. But I'm going to give you a new covenant, even different from what your parents have. No, I'm not going to do away with the law. But I want to make it so that you will be able to not only look at the laws, but it'll be part of you. That before you think of doing something wrong, you say, uh-uh, uh-uh, it's like radar. No, 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 no. You're part of God. So, it says in 32, Notwithstanding to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although... <laughs> I was a husband unto them, said the Lord, although he was faithful to them. 33 says, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, said the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. And will be their God, and they should be my people. When I read that, I was just so happy. He's saying, But this is the new covenant, people. I will make with the people of Israel after those days. And you too, okay? Says the Lord, I will put my instruction deep within them and I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. I was listening the other day to our minister Bill and he says, you know, some people 
freeze up when they see the police. He says, but I don't. I speak to them and go on. If you know you're not doing anything wrong, you don't have to get, oh, oh. The same way with the Word of God. I thank God. Because when you're in Christ, you're not the same. Everything changes. I don't have to worry about when I ask him to lead God and direct me now. I have to have the Holy Spirit. You have to have the Holy Spirit to do those things. I don't worry about, ooh, am I going to tell a lie today? Am I going to steal? Am I going to commit adultery, fornication? I'm not going to be envious because because he has written it in my heart, that radar goes up. Uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. You're a child of the Most High God. You're not the same. That's not part of your DNA anymore. Because you have the BA born again. So we have to have a renewing of our mind. So that God can put his word on the inside of us. We carry our Bibles, but we don't carry them everywhere we go. But we should carry it in our heart. We should revisit those words that we have read. Don't just read the word and say, okay, well, I, I read my Bible today. When you read, read with expectation. The Lord, what are you going to teach me today? What are you going to put in me today? What do you want me to know today? Cover me, Lord, in your word. And Lord, bring it back to my remembrance when I need your word. And he will do it. He said he's going to do a new thing. Yes, he wrote it on the tablets. And yes, Moses preached and taught them. But he said, I want it to be in your heart. In other words, I want you not to just listen, but be doers of the word. Because a lot of us will listen, go to church, Bible study, or whatever. But are you really taking it in? That's part of you. If we're going to want to be with Christ forever, we have to take in what he has put for us forever. And he said, this heaven, even where he is now, and this earth where we are now, it's going to pass away. But my word will never. So put your word in me, Lord. That should be our prayer. Lord, put your word in me. Talk to God through your prayers. But you let him talk to you through his word. So he can put a new thing in your heart. So that you can be filled with his presence. Not sometimes, but all the time. You be mindful that I belong to Jesus. And he belongs to me. And I must represent him at all times. If you do that, you'll be mindful how you approach a person. You'll be mindful of when to speak, how to speak, and where to speak. You'll be mindful of those things. When someone does something ugly to you, instead of you retaliating, you'll be mindful to say, vengeance is the Lord. He's got this. But Lord, help me still to love that person, even though they're not loving me right now. Because Lord, you got that. And the same way you changed me, you can change them as well. That's the kind of God. That's the God that I serve. He is a change God that would change us. He changes not, I'm sorry, but he is able to change us. 
Because he's the same today, forever. Yesterday, today, and forever. But he is there to change us from our ways so that we can be more like him and less of ourselves. Our last verse is verse 34. And he says, And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them and to the greatest of them, said the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I remember will remember their sins no more. Now this is what God had given Jeremiah and this is the future okay Jeremiah been gone a long time he been in heaven a long time but his word is still going on God is saying in those days and this is the new covenant okay even for us now he's saying that we won't have to in those days ask people to repent because they'll already be in Christ. We won't have to witness because they'll already be part of him because a new thing, a new covenant that's in their heart. He says, but they shall all know me from the least to the greatest of them. And he says, he will forgive us. And he has, when we ask God to forgive us of our sin and to save me, he does. And he throws it in the sea of forgiveness. And he said, I will remember their sin no more. Mm. And you think, now some of us have done some bad stuff. We really have. God, you're not going to bring that up? Mm -mm. What? I don't remember that. You asked me to cleanse you and to wash you and to make you over. You're a new person. You're a new creature in me. I'm not going to bring that up because that was your past. And all things are made, what? New. That's in the past. And I just thank God. And that's, that's something to, to shout about. And I thank God. And I just want to read this little bit right here. In a world where rules matter, we can easily take a rigid approach to developing our relationship with God. We, be, we can begin to tout how much of a better Christian we are because we are in line with the rules and regulations of the church and society. But when we take this approach, we run the risk of ostracizing and marginalizing people who might be new to the faith or have a different understanding of God. Just because we've been saved and born again should not make us think that we're better than someone else because we still have to pray every day for the Holy Spirit to lead, guide, and direct us. <coughs> and you know, some people, and we have to be mad for ourselves. Oh, look at them. They're drinking. They're high. They're doing this and that and the other. They need to be ashamed of themselves. <clears throat> That's true. But God is a long-suffering God. Don't go and witness that way. Please don't. Show them the word of God. 
in love. No one wants to be pounded, pounded on. They know what they're doing. Ask the Holy Spirit to give you the words to say to them and how to say it to them. And don't you think that you have arrived because you haven't. You're still here. We have to pray for one another and you take a person where they are. And like this is saying, just because you may not be doing what you were delivered from, you still have to pray so that you don't enter into temptation. And most of all, so that we can have empathy for our brothers and sisters who may not be on that level, but you continue to pray because you were not always on the level that you're on. And you may not be up there yet. So we have to ask the Lord to continue to create in us a clean heart and renew a right spirit. We're about to finish it up now. And I thank God. Jeremiah's prophecy was important because it helped people shift social and cultural understanding of what it's meant to be in obedience to God. Obedience in the heart made for outward expression of obedience. Many times in our churches we can mis mistake the outward expression and appearance as a measure of what's going on in a person's heart. For example, if someone is dressed nicely in a suit or wears a beautiful big hat, church hat, then we assume that they are in good standing, a good place with God. We listen to how people talk. You know, some people can really expound on the word and do all this you know, or orientation and stuff. He says, we listen to how people talk. With certain religious tones and assume that this is really a holy person. This is how a holy person talks. This is not necessarily the case. God is more concerned about what goes on. <laughs> in the heart than these outward expressions. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. God knows if you're real. And we have to continue to pray. No. As he told Jeremiah, these people, I'm going to tear it down. I tore it down. I broke it down. Even the animals, I will replenish. I will make new. And even with the word, I'm not going to do away with it. But I'm going to make it where they can understand it better. And not only would they just read it and say, oh, I can't do this today. But it'll be in their heart of what's good, what's bad, and what's profitable for kingdom building. We can always remember everything I don't. I just thank God. I had to share this with you. The other day, I was uh, pondering and I was looking for a particular scripture. I couldn't find it. I could not find it. I was sitting right here in this spot. And I said, Holy Spirit, please help me to find this scripture. And you know, when I turned another page, it was right there. I started to call my husband, but I just... Praise the Lord by myself. And I say, oh, you're just so awesome. Even before you, I called, you were right there. 
And I thank God because that day I was uh, looking and I wanted to find it because I like to back everything up with the Word of God. And He showed me that scripture at that particular time. And I was so elated. And I just began to praise the Lord. Because I knew it was nobody but, but, but him. And God would do that. We don't have it because we don't ask him. But whatever you need, God's got it. He's got it, Sister Margaret. And he wants us to ask him. The Holy Spirit has never failed me. When I've lost things, I saw the Spirit. And the next thing I know, I look around. There it is. There it is. Trust Him. Let Him clean out this heart. Renew your mind so that He can be used. So that you can, He can use you. And that when you allow Him to use you, he will be there for you at all times. I thank God for this lesson. Thank God for you. And I just want to read this out to you a little bit. Because what we're doing this year is going through the books of the Bible. And the next book after Jeremiah is Limitations. And this, this is a little bit about limitations we would not be going into it but just a little synopsis of it <coughs> and it says limitations consist of passionate expression of grief composed by the prophet Jeremiah the weeping prophet so he wrote the book and then he wrote the limitations too during the exile he expresses his sorrow over Jerusalem, the city he has done his best to save, and the horror of being torn from the Jewish homeland and taken away to Babylon. The Book of Limitations must have been written after the death of King Josiah. He was a good king. And between the burning of Jerusalem and the departure of the remnant to Egypt. Jeremiah 39, 2, 41, 1, 18, chapter 43 to 47 verses. However, Jeremiah's sorrow was not without a mixture of faith. He believed that beauty would come from ashes, amen, of the city. He had hope that the city would rise again from its ruins. In fact, Jerusalem did rise again and would give its name to the capital of the world of eternal glory. Hebrews 12, 22 and Revelations 21, 2. Amen. God's word for his people. And next week, we will be in Ezekiel, God's divine glory return. Ezekiel, God's glory, divine glory returns. And it's taken from Ezekiel chapter 43, verses, let's see so I can get it right now, verses 1 through 12. Ezekiel 43 verses 1 through 12. I hope you've gotten something out of this lesson I have. Keep the faith. Keep praying. Keep hoping. Keep believing. And never stop talking to the Lord. And never stop Him from talking to you by reading His Word. I love you, my brother. I love you, my sister. Thank you, Nicole, honey, for all you do in making this possible. 
Thank you, my dear husband, for making this possible. And thank you, Kimberly Brown, for making this possible too. And thank you for watching. Give us a thumbs up. But most of all, pray. We pray in your name, Jesus, that this word will go to the masses. And whatever was left out, Lord, you reveal it to your people. Thank you. I love you. And if it's God's will, I'll see you next year. <laughs> Be blessed.